Okay, we'll now uh, hear uh, Representative Bailey's uh, House Bill 1568. And if we could, I uh, just want to remind people we could try and, uh, I know this is a very emotional bill, but uh, we need to be out here by one o'clock just to remind people to try not to be repetitive when you testify. Representative Bailey. Chairman, thank you. Um, members, thank you for um, hearing this today. I will be quick since we have a lot of witnesses to get to, uh, but first I want to thank Representative Mackey who is um, co-presenting with me today. Um, last year we heard this bill at the very end of session and um, I think he saw my expression on my face <laughs> and because uh, I was quite shocked and appalled and um, we spoke afterwards and um, decided to both um, file this bill this year. So um, we'll give a I'll give a little bit of background, but there there are some specialists and some um, uh, folks in the back and behind us here that have it down to a T and they know these definitions and everything. But right now, the state of Missouri does not have um, our own statute uh, regarding this. Um, it's left up to the uh, school boards on how they want to do it. Um, and if you know me at all, I'm a limited government type person. I don't like regulating anybody. Um, but the abuses that are occurring um, are pretty scary. And um, I've heard story after story. A few more came in in the interim since we've been out at our training. And this has been going on for years. And um, originally these rooms are, are supposed to be for safety. Safety if a student is going to harm himself or others. That's it. It's not for um, punishment or discipline or um, a timeout where they're um, secluded by themselves. Um, I have some pictures coming. Um, my legislative assistant will be putting them up. Um, and it's going to give you an idea. Until I saw, until I heard the so stories and then actually saw these rooms, um, you think it's almost unheard of. You're, you're, how does this happen in 2020? Um, and you'll see these rooms. They're basically solitary confinement. Um, one room is wooden, the other one is padded. Um, and again, having a, a child with um, a disability, even I have a child that doesn't have a disability, putting either one of them in a room in a school setting when they're already either dealing with something or already traumatized to put them in these rooms, um, only you cause further trauma. Um, we send our schools, uh, we send our kids to school to, to learn um, and hopefully encounter those with compassion and love. Um, and in turn, with these rooms um, and restraints, they are, 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 fur are further traumatized. Um, I do have an expert here today. Um, he is a, a, a present um, superintendent from Missouri. And he is, uh, because people have asked me, what do we do, what do we do besides this? Well, anything but put our kids in a box. But he actually has proven um, innovative solutions. And um, we're going to have him come up next. But um, thank you for um, hearing this bill today. I'm just going to turn over to Representative Mackey real quick. Sure. I, I really don't want to take any time adding to that because we, we do have folks behind us uh, with stories to tell. But I'm ha here to uh, help answer questions if anybody has them. OK. Um, Representative Brown, proceed. Joe inquire. Go ahead. Just one quick question. Do we know how prevalent this behavior is? It, um, we know we know that it's in every part of the state. So we don't we don't know you know um, of the 537 districts we don't have a count on exactly how many have isolation rooms. But we know through media stories over the last couple of years that there have been misuses in St. Louis, in Kansas City, in Columbia, in Springfield. Um, and so the fact that it's pervasive throughout the state um, and and in some of those stories um, you know have led to lawsuits being filed in, in various different places. Um, it, it, and we know from the Federal Department of Education that between 2,300 and 2,400 kids were locked in a room in the most recent year of reporting, which was 2013 and 2014. That's just when the, when the door is locked, um, which, which doesn't account for a whole lot of cases. And that's already almost 2,500 kids in one school year. So that's in the state of Missouri? Correct. So I noticed that part of your the bill it talks about a reporting system. Is that why we don't have an accurate number because we don't have an accurate reporting system? That and then also um, there are a lot of loopholes and um, say uh, seclusion. If a child is put in a room and say they put 
a mat. For yep. instance, they put a mat in front of the door, they can call that a timeout. Even if they don't lock it. Even if they don't the door lock it. And leave it unlocked. It's so, generally not recorded. Well, there are those loopholes that we're going to try and close. Um, so, yeah, that the recording is um, skittish. So, these are different than what, like for where I come from, we have therapy rooms. These are right. different from this. Different from therapy rooms. Very yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Children aren't alone in those therapies. The biggest point of this is it's a, it's a percent, in almost all cases, children are being left alone. Oh, uh, just a second. Um, I, Representative Mackey, I uh, just want to point out, this is the same bill that we heard in this committee last, at the end of last session in April. Yeah. Um, and um, there were no, but we, we passed it out of this committee with zero no votes. Right. And it passed rules with zero no votes. Right. So this is essentially the same legislation. It is. And okay. I hope, I, and I, I mean, I hope we have, a, we've had a lot of discussions this week about what we may or may not add to it. So no promises that this will be this. We hope to have conversation with everybody on the committee about what folks are comfortable with in terms of in terms of adjusting some language here or there um, to make sure that we're actually getting at the same clause that we tried to get at last year when we all did vote to, to pass this language in this bill. And through this Thank hearing, we're, we're finding out even more information. And so that's kind of why we just wanted to leave it as is. It's kind of due process for everybody. I want to hear both sides, hear testimonies, and then we're going to decide what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Representative Morgan, uh, go ahead, ma'am. I'm looking at uh, page three of the bill and it's existing language. Actually, it's in uh, five and it talks about Destiny was supposed to develop a model policy. Did, did, did they actually do that? That's the policy that most districts, almost all districts to my knowledge, have in place already. The problem is it's not being followed in many cases. And there's no recourse for folks to take when a school board policy is not being followed. Certainly not enough recourse that, that they'd be able to take if that policy had the force of law. Okay. And does the policy as it's written now basically do what you want to do? In writing, in writing the, uh, the policy for the most part, again, there's some changes here or there around definitions. We've seen a lot of folks um, tinker with semantics trying to distinguish between what, what is alone versus unattended, what is secluded versus isolated. If you look up those words in Webster's Dictionary, they're quite synonymous. They, they essentially mean the very same thing, but folks are really fine-tuning um, um, how they want to go about this. Um, uh, at first glance on paper, the policy's great. The problem is folks are either gaming it or not following it. Okay, so, the, so even though it says model policy and statute, you're saying people aren't following the statute that says model policy? Uh, the model policy requires that the district have a policy in place, okay. and, 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 and it's not being followed. Okay, yeah. okay. And then in terms of the reporting, whenever... And, and the districts okay. don't have to have the model policy. The districts are permitted to write their own policies. Okay. But, but most of them have adopted the model policy. They've adopted the one that Desi had, okay. Yeah. But they've been tinkering with it recently. Okay, for the good or the bad? The bad. For the bad, okay. And then in terms of the reporting, um, Anybody who witnessed the child being placed in seclusion or restraint was going to be a report, including law enforcement, including any law enforcement personnel oh, right. working with the school district. So, so, so those right. would not be like the outside law enforcement. That would just be the security yeah. officers. That, Contracted folks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other questions for the uh, representatives? Seeing none, okay, now going forward, we're going to uh, try and limit, uh, we're going to rotate between for and against, um, and then we're going to limit, uh, how many people here to testify for this bill? Okay, how many against? Against? Okay. Um, we're going to try and limit it to about two minutes apiece, we could, so we can try and finish by uh, one o'clock. Mr. So. Chair, if you would give me the um, leniency of having my specialist come up now. Um, and, and giving it, us his solutions and innovations and giving him a little bit more time because I think he has kind of what we need here that missing piece okay. and it's been pretty negative so far so I want to hear some positive stuff <laughs> all right thank you so Dr. McCoy if you'd come forward please
First, thank you for having me. And thank you, uh, Sarah, Representative um, Bailey, for your, your leadership in this regard. What you are getting is a journal for Jennings, and I'll cite the last two pages. And inside it is a one pager for a strategy for a solution other than seclusion. Um, Sorry to interrupt, sir. Could you uh, get us your name, your name here? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Dr. Art McCoy, uh, Superintendent of Schools for Jennings School District. And I'm uh, here in favor of the bill. Uh, so for the sake of time, let me just share that um, our school district does not have any seclusion rooms at all. Instead, we have comfort spaces and comfort rooms in every school for teachers and for students. Uh, it's an environment that's aimed to do with my article that's entitled uh, Mental Health Matters on the very, uh, I guess, second to last page. It describes, uh, ultimately, this is this is both academic research as well as been sent out to all of St. Louis County, St. Charles County by virtue of this newspaper. Uh, you have to produce peace within uh, or an environment that helps produce peace and solution, uh, exclusion and seclusion does not produce peace. Secondly, you have to provide something that's a safe environment uh, in, in schools, homes, and beyond. Uh, thirdly, you have to engage in emotional and development and empowerment. And so uh, comfort spaces is a best practice. I'm actually presenting in Toronto next week uh, to about 2,000 people on comfort spaces and mental health. Uh, so let me first describe at least our, our setting. Um, in every school, we have two therapists beyond uh, the school. They're not hired by the school district. They're from Provident, from BJC, from uh, Youth in Need, and so forth. We have uh, one psychiatrist on staff. Uh, that works with us. She's the chair of Washington University Psychiatry Department, Dr. Joan Luby. Uh, this information has come from her research as well as some of what I'm going to speak to. We have two health-based clinics. One is the Spot Clinic, Washington University. The other one is Murder Hilly Davis Caris TL, which is a federally qualified uh, federal health clinic. Um, so now, given that space, we also are members of special school districts. So we have special school district staff, uh, we have a coordinate, two coordinators and one director. Um, in my conversations even with special, uh, special acknowledges that it's not, a, it's not a practice in public school settings that we use. So like for instance, my school district, uh, they acknowledge and support our policy against it. Um, and so I know special will speak about special, but uh, ultimately, in speaking with our physician and our psychiatrist, she's going on record, uh, Dr. Joan Ruby, to say that she's uh, against it. It feels like it only has an appropriate usage in a clinical type setting or very restricted usage where you have a medical kind of trained person on staff for, for facilitation of, of certain particular things uh, psychologically to empower them. So let me get to the practice that we're doing. We're the first in the state of Missouri to be utilizing child parent interaction therapy or let's call it parent child interaction therapy um, and we've also trained our teachers on teacher child interaction therapy um, it's aimed to build any type of boundaries that are needed for any type of emotional meltdown it's aimed to reconnect children to adults children to parents children to teachers children to people of authority it tackles some of the, uh, the emotional disturbances uh, in the terms of special school district educational diagnoses and other health impaired. Uh, it tackles schizophrenia, bipolar, and other from a medical diagnosis, and, and it's more effective than medication. The research has been proven and shown. We just happen to be the first school district in the state of Missouri to implement this actual practice called parent-child interaction therapy and teacher-child interaction therapy. The article there highlights that we were able to raise $800,000 in like a month. It doesn't require that much. It just requires training. It requires the appropriate facilities. We have two uh, rooms that are peace and comfort rooms, but with one-way or two-way mirrors where you can't see on the outside, but you can see from the inside. If, in order to have the teacher be observed by a trained therapist while trying to have the meltdown or the emotional meltdown uh, be adjusted in a way that's emotionally healthy. Um, we've seen in our area, and you know, it being in Jennings, literally educating a third of Ferguson and a tip of the city of St. Louis, uh, we've had zero killings in a summer that had 23 shootings of young people from June to August. We've had zero of our students shoot someone or be shot, and we're literally part of the St. Louis City. And that's a part of trauma in a, in a different way. Uh, I know it's not about seclusion as much, but it's about 
the fact that we have to create our schools uh, in a way and make them be centers for healing engagement. And so the resources, I see this bill as something that stops us from being centers of uh, seclusion, isolation, and, and incarceration. Uh, but I think that going even a step further in the way I've described by having peace and comfort rooms with therapists on staff helps this to become centers for healing engagement because ultimately if we don't heal them, uh, help heal students and young people, um, uh, I'm not sure who else will uh, because they don't heal themselves. They need someone to be a catalyst and oftentimes parents need support. Um, I, I can speak to a lot of other things, but I'm going to pause there because I want to take the time to just answer questions that you may have uh, related to this policy. There's a few things that I would suggest adding, like uh, uh, in the event that it doesn't totally abolish seclusion and restraints all, or with seclusions altogether, it should be defined that a certain limit of time is used so that there's a maximum time, even in the setting where it is permissible. Uh, like even in settings that are, let's say, Ackerman or Southview, Northview, those are schools within the special school district that are third level, uh, highest tiers for the most emotionally disturbed. So even in that setting, there should be time limits. There should be requirements for those who are able to do it, like medical training, restraint training for sure, which I know special does, and all of our staff are, are trained on how to do restraints. But I think even beyond that, a certain portion of medical training and a requirement to have a nurse be present for documentation of whether you're actually increasing vital signs for them uh, hyperventilating, passing out, breaking an arm, doing something, or if you're decreasing those signs, like on a regular monitored basis. Um, so again, I'm in favor for what's present, and as a superintendent of the schools, I would even suggest adding more <laughs> to it to put regulations in, and uh, to those places that are even uh, given the slight permission to use it only in the most extreme cases. And I, I yield to you for any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Um, any questions for Dr. McCoy? Representative Eisler. Uh, permission to inquire. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick, I, I noticed that just uh, the, the program is for children two through seven. That's correct. And so what, what is it that you're doing? Because obviously you're doing some great work in other integrated area, areas. That's right. Levels, so, I, I so definitely. So, so, um, so the two through seven and eight is specifically where I'm paying parents $400 per child, if they have a two-year-old, and they have a three-year-old, and a four-year-old, and a five-year-old, we'll pay them uh, 400 times three children to literally go through 12 weeks of training with our psychiatrists and with our district therapists, specifically on how to have bonding skills, to rebond, to have boundary setting, to know how to respond in the sense that there's a disruptive uh, meltdown where the child is harmful to themselves or others. There is a component within that training where um, where willful, um, willful disconnection occurs between the mother and the child if they literally are just acting in a temper tantrum manner to get what they want from that age range. It's not seclusion because they're never alone, and it's not even um, ignoring because it's, uh, it's not that you don't still look at the child and say, I'm here to support you when you're ready, but it's a boundary setting to say, there are certain socially appropriate behaviors and we cannot reward this. So that's what that does from that early age range because once you get past eight, um, most of the behavior is either willful or much more tends to try to correct. But it does extend past eight to 18. This training can occur all the way through 21 and beyond. Um, other things that we're doing is, so as a public school system, and this is kind of unrelated to emotional um, uh, situations, but it does help with regard to trauma and, and self and well-being. We guarantee, we have four guarantees as a school system. We guarantee every child a paid internship by graduation. Our students get paid up to $20 to $25 an hour from Aberisi, Clay Coat, and many other places. We guarantee them an IRC, an industry-recognized credential, so we're big at workforce development. Uh, every child gets at least one IRC or they get up to 65 college credit hours in associate's degree at no cost, all taxpayer paid to any college of their choice, once you included, while in high school. They get a year's worth of power skills. It's similar to soft skills, but it's interpersonal skills. Uh, and they get a year's worth of entrepreneurship training so they can learn to be producers and not just consumers. Uh, and that has led us to having 100% graduation three years in a row, 2016, 17, and 18, and 97% last year, and 100% college or career placement. Every kid goes to college 
or they're in a career. Well, that's because we pay for it. We see it. We have the bill to prove it. <laughs> and uh, we make it happen before they leave and they continue in a career or college. Um, so we're really pleased with those results. We're 100% free and reduced lunch. We're at 98% African American population. We're in a promise zone, but we're 100% successful for the last five years. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of that. Congratulations. Thank you. Representative Stacy. Well, this is to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I would recommend that you uh, uh, make it happen that to all of our committee go to Jennings for a uh, wonderful tour of all of their facilities so that uh, we, we understand fully what's going on there. We might be able to do that, maybe. Represent Oops. <laughs> Representative, I did go and tour the facility, and that's when I met Dr. McCoy, and I couldn't believe my eyes and ears and, um, and the heart that he has for these kids um, is wonderful. So yeah, he's our best kept secret, so <laughs> we need to figure it out. But I did have a question, so the um, wonderful um, therapy or, or alternative you have to seclusion, how long did it take you guys to prepare for that? Was it a year, a month, couple months, or how, you know, training everybody, just, just to give other superintendents an idea of what that would take? It's, you could be done in one month's time. Um, the training part and so forth. The colleges are willing and ready to partner. Uh, Washington University, UMSU, and all sorts of universities throughout the state have professionals ready and paid to come out and train. Uh, we did it during our all staff training, first week of school, every staff member. We also had various other trainings. It took about three months to convert a closet space uh, that in classroom into a uh, into a comfort space with um, with like spa music, um, with recliners, with toys like you know GI Joes and, and, and Care Bears. Well, I mean they have all the, any figure you can think of, and adults actually spend a lot of time. But this has actually increased my adult attendance because they get a moment as teachers to be able to say, I can pause in my day, go to a comfort space, and have a moment where I can just kind of just let the stress go. You couldn't imagine how much our teachers appreciate this, because then, you know, you have to have your cup filled to be able to have the patience to go give more. And it's increased our attendance. I've, I could tell you stories about teachers talking to our therapists, which, which is an in-house therapist, just to say, let's talk what's really bothering you. For our students, at any time, and our teachers. Uh, we have warrior room spaces because we're the home of the warriors where students can volunteer to go at any time to get either therapeutic time or just some comfort time. Stuff from my dog died to custody disputes to uh, I just feel like I don't have it anymore, the energy, the strength to make it, my scores, I'm worried about that, I'm worried about not succeeding my students. That's from teachers, that's teacher talk as far as the therapy that they receive. The student talk, it ranges from everything under the sun, how to deal with the peer pressure of social media. I just had no one like my picture that I put out there or, or I feel like I'm not keeping up with everyone else who so has the good life. I mean, at the middle school and the high school level, that's huge, um, it's huge. And so, so if a person is having attention because something just got blasted that made them be portrayed in a way that's not them, there's always a, re a reason behind the action. Uh, we don't exclude or seclude, we lean in and try to create peace. And so three months for a conversion of a room, one month for teaching all staff, um, and, and many partners, university level and, and therapeutic partners. And, and what's the name of it again? Uh, so the, the, the clinical uh, practice is teacher-child inter interaction therapy okay. and then parent-child interaction therapy. I also think uh, mindfulness moments is important where you build in time where students start their day centering themselves from any worry, from any situation that they had prior to coming in. They do guided self uh, a visualization, that's another biofeedback technique that's an emerging health practice. Uh, so if you just Google biofeedback, it'll give you four practices. Mindfulness, meditation, uh, self-visualization. When, when, when psychiatrists say, think of your happy place, go to your happy place, it's that. Uh, like some of us think of the beach, other people think of that time, that teddy bear. Uh, students do that at the start of the day, at lunchtime, and then uh, in classrooms and at the end of the day. And it helps with self-regulation. If you make that a natural part of the, of the school environment, students are able to know when they're about to lose it. Uh, we teach them that there's one letter difference and one emotional difference from danger. Uh, anger, if you take off the D, uh, is danger. And so they begin to stop the danger by monitoring 
their anger with biofeedback. What is your body giving you as feedback to say, I'm starting to sweat. Um, you know, my, my pupils are dilating because I can't see as far. I mean, I got kids coming up and saying, my, I know my signals, I need to walk away. And so, um, so that's, so when you empower a child to be able to do that, uh, that's the end result that most parents, all parents want. They want their child to be okay, and they want them to be okay with or without them. And that's what we make a part of the start of the day, lunchtime, and the end of the day. Okay, thank you, sir. Any other questions for Dr. McCoy? Sure, appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make a quick announcement. I, I'm going to kind of go back on what I said. Um, due to the nature of this bill, it's a very uh, emotional subject. We've been talking up here. We're going to um, we're going to let people just uh, testify as they want and um, not limit the time. But we're at one o'clock. We're going to um, end this hearing. Not end it, but we're going to carry it over to next Wednesday. That's a week from tomorrow at 8 a.m. in the morning, and we'll be in H.R. 7. Um, so thank you. Proceed, Mr. Gamble. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Bill Gamble, registered lobbyist uh, representing the special school district. Yeah, I think this is going to be like you call it opposition light. So we'll, we'll go from there. And again, my apologies. Uh, just got these comments, and usually. So, uh, Let's start with the definitions uh, are, are not inconsistent with uh, what we already do as district policy. So the definitions of the bill are consistent with what we do. The limit to health and safety is already covered under our policy, we believe. Uh, the only problem that we foresee in the bill and, and we're how you do this and uh, uh, a little bit of the, and I'll try to explain further, the. The bureaucracy of the reports to DESI. And I'll tell you why. We do, and to understand about special school district, we're the largest school district in the state. We only have students who have IEPs, who are, are physically handicapped, and autistic kids. We, Those are our students. And when I say we're, we are special, we're special to oh. The only other district is down in southeast Missouri that's very similar to us. So we're, we're different, and we cover all of St. Louis County. And as Superintendent Jenny says, they're one of the school districts that, uh, uh, that we serve. We do, given the students that we have, and these students, thank be to God that we don't have to go through what, these, what, what the challenges that these students have. I mean, we're, we're extremely fortunate. Because they've, you know, it's it's tough, and they go through it, and they go to, they go to class, and they, they work hard, and we're we're proud of them. Um, we do have to do a number of restraints over uh, through the year. What kind of rooms is a good question. I don't know. I'll find out what kind of restraint rooms um, that we have. Uh, that's I do not have an answer to that question, but. The, the reporting to DESE is is probably the issue that we have uh, just because of the having to do the reports, how much the reports, what DESE is going to want to do, is it going to be different than our policy. Uh, the devil's many times is in the details. Um, so here's what we do. We already notify the parent verbally and in writing if their child is restrained or secluded. Uh, we always already provide parents due process rights as required by the state regulations. A parent already has a right to request an IEP under IDEA, and they already have a right uh, to file a complaint with DESI. So we provide all of those rights to the students. Uh, the the issue I think that we would like to work with the sponsor on the bill is just the reporting. We, we, um, our policies are very extensive, very well documented, and uh, just just that whole, what are we going to send? How much are we going to send? How much time is it going to take? That's that's the 
that's the, the question we have. I will close by saying that the special school district for the second time has received the state uh, Baldridge uh, Quality Award. And I think that, that says a lot in our, our satisfaction um, uh, surveys that we get back for the parents are in the 90%. And so it's a plan I'm very proud of, very proud of the service that they, that they provide to the students and very proud of the students too. I will also close one other thing. We still have to abide by the state standards. And we still are, a, are a, we're, we're still uh, certified. I think that says a lot for the special school district. Thank you, Mr. Gamble. Um, Representative Bailey. Thanks, Mr. Gamble. Um, just to reiterate what you said, I have, uh, my kiddo has had um, special school, or special school district services for many years now, and it's been wonderful. Okay. And I praise you all, the, the teachers, I mean, it's been wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I, I wish that service could be for all districts, and I've wished that a lot, because I think what we're running into is um, some situations where um, we really need it. But I, but I appreciate the special school district um, immensely, and the work that you all do has been great. So yeah, let's talk about the paperwork and stuff and details and figure that out. And anytime anyone would like to come and visit, uh, certainly uh, are, are welcome, and please contact us and we can arrange it. Or if you already have a relationship there, go go right ahead and go for it, because they're always willing to show and, and, and talk to you about the uh, uh, the educational services they provide. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, hold on, Representative Brown. I uh, just wanted to, I'm sorry for all the changes. We Mandatory training is what's causing all the, the trouble. Um, so um, our analyst has to be out of here at one. But we, we do have somebody coming to take his place, so we now we are going to um, keep going until 1.30 today. Okay. So apologize for all the changes, but um, that's what's uh, going on. Representative Brown, go ahead and proceed. Just to make a request. Go ahead. Mr. Yep. Gamble, could you forward the committee uh, those policies that you're speaking of just so we have something to work from? Sure. Thank you so much. Sure, I'll, I'll I don't have them on hand. I will, I will have to make that request. So. Thank you. Okay. You can send them to me. And then sure, I'll okay. I'll do it. Representative Morgan. Go ahead. Go ahead, Thank you. Good afternoon. So you said the special school district already does a report, both verbally and in writing, to the parents whenever a child is restrained or secluded. Uh, is it does just one person make that report, or multiple people involved in the? Uh... I, I don't know. I'll find out. Okay. I'll find out how uh, how many people are involved in the report. I would assume that the report is going to be based upon everybody who had an interaction with that uh, with that experience. And, and do you know exactly what's in the report? Is it kind of like a form where somebody fills it out? I, I, I do not. And is that I, something I can, maybe you could get to us? And we'll, we'll, Great. we'll get that information to you and, 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 and what we do. And okay. And do you have, so you, I know you said that your concerns are primarily with the reporting to DESE. I think it's because we interact with the parent and we interact with the family. And it's the student and the family and we're, we're doing that interaction and we think it appears to work and we think that's what you want us to do. And um, it's kind of like going through a third party in a way. And so we, I think we would say that if we're already doing these things and we're communicating with the parent and you feel comfortable with that and the family and the student and we're trying to, to work that through those situations and provide that that student the help and assistance they need because that's what the special school district does then I think that's that's probably our, our, our primary concern it's kind of like you're doing two things we're interacting with the parent we're interacting with the student we're interacting with the family and now we have to pass Send it along to, to Jefferson City and and, and you said part of your process, you do let parents know there's due process if they're yes. not, if they're not. Um, that's required by law. Okay. We have to do that. Because they, they, they can then make an appeal. Yes. So that's already in place. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Okay. And like I said, even uh, we, we allow for the recordings as, uh, for the uh, right. previous bills. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Amble? No, see, no. thank you very much. We've got a little work to do. Okay, <laughs> um, could we um, go ahead, ma'am? Yeah. Are you in support? Yes. Okay, yes. proceed. Thank you, I'm Phyllis Wolfram, the Executive Director for the Missouri Council of Administrators of Special Education. We're very much in favor of this bill. We agree it's important for Missouri to take a stand and provide specific direction regarding the issue to ensure the safety of students and staff in our schools. It's important we protect our students and use restraint and seclusion only in emergency situations. This should be the last resort for any student. We feel very strongly about this. There is currently a reporting system in place. It is through the Office of Civil Rights. So school districts are required now to report seclusion, restraint, mechanical restraint. Their data, um, there's not a lot of accountability for reporting that. Uh, I can give you a, for example, um, Chicago Public Schools and New York City Public Schools, uh, and the last data collection that came out reported zero. So Missouri, I do have some updated numbers, and I did ask Desi to provide those to me. Um, they did a little bit of a recalculation, so it's even higher than what was given to Representative Mackey and I believe Representative uh, Bailey. But seclusion in Missouri was reported at 6,555. Um, 6, Mechanical restraint at 175, and physical restraint at 4,920. We feel very strongly uh, that we leave nothing to question when we talk about definitions of restraint and seclusion. And so we would really encourage uh, a, a relook at those definitions with regard to the definitions that OCR requires us to report on right now. We can make those more thorough, but at a minimum, we don't want confusion over how this information gets to be re is reported. And uh, so we, we have gone through and we've made some recommendations and I know we're running for time and I will just leave those recommendations and again, uh, on behalf of the administrators across the state, we think it is imperative that some changes be made, um, that we do have a very accurate reporting system. We right now don't report anything to DESE, they go and grab the OCR information. But I think if we're going to, um, and I appreciate the, the comments from special school district, uh, most school districts have a policy in place because in 2010, DESE was required from the previous legislation to develop a model policy and school districts had to uh, put a policy into place. So we have it, they keep the data themselves, we do, uh, but there is no way of tracking it, and, and we believe that we do have a crisis. We do have a problem statewide, nationwide, and that we aren't providing uh, sometimes the type of instruction. And, and our superintendent from Jennings, what a, what a wonderful report. I want to go see his school district so that I can share that with other administrators uh, across the state. Um, we, we do, we would like the language of the bill to be very precise. There's one part that talks about promoting safe, that you know, uh, you don't use it at seclusion and restraint unless you're promoting the safety and health of students. We'd like you to just remove the word promote in any context of seclusion and restraint. Uh, I put that and I've listed that down. Um, we again would like you to take a really strong look at the definitions so that we have to report to OCR. Last Thursday, they just came out with a video uh, from the U.S. Department of Education talking about seclusion and restraint. They're going to crack down, too. I think they're going to be on us to get accurate reporting data. I don't think they're changing their definitions, but we will have to report on what they tell us. Um, I did not bring a copy of that information, but we can provide that to the committee to, to take a look at. You were talking about model forms. There are, part of the DESE's model policy was to produce model forms for school districts to fill out. I think it's worth taking a look at those to say, how do we revise those to include all of the type of data and reporting that Missouri wants to maintain in order to um, track what is happening in our schools and provide those supports to our schools to make changes. Um, 
I'll stop there to see if there's there's any questions. I have left some detailed information. I would, let me say one more thing. I think there is some confusion over how you file a complaint with DESI. When you talk about a child complaint, a child complaint is typically uh, a complaint under the IDEA. And these complaints would be for all parents. I'm afraid parents would call and say, hey, I want to file a child complaint. Um, they would say, Do your, does your child have an IEP? No. Well, we can't help you. So the complaint process needs to be reviewed so that it is there for all people. Uh, the child complaint process is if there is a violation of FAPE, free and appropriate public education, under the IDEA. So we, we don't want to leave any confusion there for our parents and how they can uh, have uh, a voice if they need to take something further. So there are a number of things, again, that we would love the opportunity to work on. We would love for Missouri to be a forerunner in what this policy looks like so we can share it uh, and we would just shine. Uh, so I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, ma'am. It's good information. Mm -hmm. Any questions for the representative uh, the Morgan? Sure, go ahead. Just a clarification on the Office of Civil Rights Complaints that you were talking about. Um, is the data similar to what is um, referenced in the bill in terms of what's reported to DESE? Um, I think what's reported to DESE might be a little more extensive. Okay. The reporting that goes to OCR is strictly numbers. Okay, okay, that was my question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Representative Bailey? Your information and your notes you're leaving here so I can contact you because let's, let's copy. chat. Yeah. And so you're the expert, you sound the uh, numbers and the reporting, and I'd love to get it right. I want to get it exactly right so we don't have to come back and do it again. Same here. And I think some of the number, some of the reporting requirements, if we don't get those definitions right, they will be interpreted wrong. And so, right now, if you look at what's OCR, what's in DESI's policy, and then what's in this, is there's three different things we're looking at. So, I think we really need to streamline that process. Are, where are you? Are you? Uh, I, am in, uh, I live in Springfield. Um, Mocase does have my office here in Jeff City that we frequent. I primarily work from home, but I will make myself available. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none. Um, next witness in support. Hello. My name is Rika Knopf. I am 11. I am. Evan, I am autistic and have anxiety disorder and depression. I am from Columbia, Missouri. Well, you already know, was it? Sorry. Um, today, I would like to talk about a couple of things. One is what these rooms are like. Two, why they're bad. Three, how they can be improved. And four, why it's important to pass House Bill 1568. Um, starting off with the first point I want to make, they, I, I know for a fact they are different depending on where you, you are. I've seen those pictures are of wooden rooms, the ones I were in were, had padded, was padded, but nonetheless, it is still solitary confinement. And this is an adapted version of solitary confinement for school. And solitary confinement was invented as a form of torture, I wish to remind you. So applying a form of torture to children, even if it is temporarily, that is inhumane. Humans are social animals. We need daily human interaction. And I've been trapped in these rooms almost all day, every day. They, now if I, <coughs> with you, I want to, um, do I have a volunteer from here? Never mind. Um, if you, if any of you were trapped in a, were, were mad, and then you were trapped in a bare padded room, would that make you calmer or make you madder? I'm, I'm asking. Exactly. Kids around the state, the country, and the world are in these rooms as we speak. So I can change to homeschool 
but because my parents had the time and the education to do so. But not all kids have that luxury. Now, I think the idea is a good one, a calm down room. I believe that's a good idea. Now, I do believe children might sometimes attempt to hurt themselves, so having squishy walls is a good idea. But I also think things like beanbag chairs, um, stuffed animals, books, puzzles, general happy things that can make you, oh, sorry, like, what would make you calm down if you were angry? Good, good yes. point. Um, okay, we need to, uh, you're, you're doing good, but we need to kind of move along, sir. So, so. Um, did you testify in front of the Columbia School Board? I, I did. I think I was there that night. You did a good job there, too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I just think it's important to get rid of this modified torture device in schools. It would, you already have the rooms and the budget necessary to get the things I have mentioned wouldn't be that high. I think it is inhumane and I feel like it, I can't speak for a lot of people, but I can speak for myself. These things deteriorated my mental health severely. It made me, this isolation room made me isolated. I didn't want to talk to anyone, even my own family. They dragged me down the hallways, bruising my arms, popped my shoulder once. And if you say push, that would be a lot less painful to the child. In conclusion, I think it is, this is a Big, nice first step, but it's a first step in a long uphill battle. Okay. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Any questions for the young man? Okay, thank you. Good job. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Sherry Borton, and I'm a board member also of Mo Case. Um, but I'm also a school administrator with the St. Clair R13 School District. I'm the director of the Franklin County um, Special Education Cooperative for school age programs. We serve 13 school districts in Franklin, Crawford, Washington, and Gasconade counties. In addition, I am a building administrator for a separate public school. We serve special education students with severe social, emotional, and behavioral issues. As a building administrator, I am in favor of this bill. Thank you for promoting school safety and providing a bill written to prevent harm to all students. We believe in treating all students with dignity and respect. 100% of my staff are trained in de-escalation and restraint techniques. We only use restraint or seclusion for the safety of students and as a last resort to keep everyone safe. There's a very small percentage of students needing this type of support. Thank you for addressing the requirement of training. As an instructor in the MANT system, my colleague Cindy Edwards and I train over 300 teachers and paraprofessionals in the co-op member districts each year. During our recertification classes, we ask the staff how many have restrained students in the past year and we're pleased to report that very few are using this high-risk technique. When we do use restraint or seclusion, we have reporting requirements that we follow for contacting parents. In addition, we report to the Office of Civil Rights. I wholeheartedly agree that accountability measures need to be in place. Thank you for your time and for giving me the opportunity to comment on this bill. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for the witness? And I want to remind everybody that testifies to fill out a witness form and leave it on the desk, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lucretia Jackson. I live in Boone County. I have a sixth grader in Columbia Public School, 
He has an IP. My son has to restrain it 133 times and placed in separate rooms at least 43 times that I know of while attending CPS. I do not automatically get the written reports or what happened. You have to know how to ask for reports. I have no idea how much was happening until I got copies of all these reports. I have an advocate read over all, all of them now. He has multiple head injuries during these restraints. Also has asthma attacks, asthma, and have been triggered during restraints in results of him losing oxygen. He's been mentally traumatized and viewed his teachers as people who beat him up. His IQ has dropped from 20 points. It was straight. He regrets in all of his academic skills. He is now diagnosed with PTSD. And it is, it is on homebound placement because of what the school has done to him. I am, I'm, am supporting this bill so the children of Missouri can have safer places to learn. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, very much. Um, any questions for Ms. Jackson? Representative Bailey. I just want to say thank you for coming forward and um, being brave. You're wonderful. And um, your son's comforting you. You're a good son. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, you being here. I know that's hard. You're wonderful. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next witness. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Baker. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director with the ACLU of Missouri. We'd like to go on record in strong support of this bill. In addition to all of the rights that you've heard that students and parents have felt like they've given up in this process, they've also been forced to shed some of their constitutional liberty throughout this process. Restraint and seclusion can well fall under the Fourth Amendment's prohibition on search and seizure and the Fourteenth Amendment's provision for due process. These students have constitutional rights that they don't shed at the schoolhouse door, but they get violated time and time again, a lot of times because there's not enough information to advocate on their behalf. So we strongly support this bill. I'm so pleased that you're considering it, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Oh, we're also you. dropping off testimony forms for a couple folks that were back there. Okay, thank you so much. Any questions for Ms. Baker? Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Schelp. Um, I'm going to pass out some papers. I think it's really important that you see what current school policy looks like. You're getting CPS's policy again, which is put out by MSBA. Um, when you get it, if you look, I'm going to go as fast as I can. You're also getting pictures of seclusion rooms because I think it's important to see the top ones were of the rooms as they were being constructed in August. The bottom is when they were finished. Um, you can see the locking mechanism, and I'm going to just point out right now that the locking mechanism only works if it's held in place. And you can see a window, and that's going to be important in a second. Um, so on page five of the policy, CPS's policy, you'll see the definition of seclusion says, as defined in this policy, it is prohibited except in an emergency situation while awaiting the arrival of law enforcement officers as provided for in state law. And Representative Mackey has said, current school policy is pretty good if it were followed. And that's the beauty of this. By, by creating a law, we're putting teeth into this. You have to follow it. But I want to take you to a change that's being made. First, we know it's not being followed. You're going to hear other stories. You can see it in the news. We have a building that has kids in kindergarten through fifth grade, less than 30 students in this building, and they just built two, uh, two seclusion rooms. OK, that just seems a little bizarre, right? So it makes you wonder, is policy really being followed? Every time we use this room, are we calling the police? And why would we need to in a building with less than 30 elementary students? Um, so, but I want to take you back to the policy. We had an issue come up in September in Columbia, and thankfully CPS did the right thing. Um, but this is something that's going to go on all over our state. If you look at the seclusion definition, this policy is CPS's proposed policy from their September board meeting. Um, they were going to change the definition of seclusion. This was a recommended change by the MSBA. Again, I agree, MSBA just recommends the change. It's up to the school district to decide if they want it. But they added the word unattended. Um, you could call it semantics, but I think when you add a word, you add a word for a reason. You don't just add a word. 
Without the word unattended, seclusion is a student alone in an unclosed, enclosed space from which he's prevented from leaving with clock and carter. So we lock the child in alone in a room, that's seclusion. You add unattended, that means that child is not being watched. Never, never, never should a child be left alone in a locked room that's going to cause harm to themselves because it's the only reason you seclude a child because it's an emergency situation. Never should you leave that child unattended. You can see the lock has to be held down and there's a window. It is impossible to put a child in this room and leave them unattended. So what you're doing, and follow it, I know this is confusing, is saying that if that child's attended and in this space, which is how it has to be, that's not seclusion anymore because they're attended, not unattended. It's also not isolation because isolation requires non-locked doors in a regular sized room. This would be timeout according to this definition. Timeout has no restrictions. It can be used as a discipline thing and parents don't have to be notified. You can use it a few times a day. This is extremely concerning to me. When this was brought up at CPS, we called them on it. We said, this is scary. Do you realize what that word unattended does? They pulled it back. They took the word out. Moberly Public Schools did the same thing. We called them. They pulled the language back. They took the word out. We contacted MSBA and said, we're really concerned. Do you realize what that word unattended did? I can't believe you would mean to put the word unattended in there, meaning it's only seclusion if the child is unattended. We don't seclude and leave a child unattended. And they said, it's perfectly fine if you look at state statute, and I don't have one in front of me, but I believe it's on the bottom of the page that you have there. It would have been in the original first section, but now it's section two. The word unattended does pop up. That if a child is left in an unattended space, that we have to call police. Understand, that is not a definition for seclusion. That is just taking the word unattended and putting it into the definition of seclusion. We have no definition for seclusion right now in the state of Missouri. So... We said, well, I understand where you came up with that word unattended, but I think it's being used wrong. They, MSB is not taking it out, at least not right now, and maybe they'll tell me differently. Um, so I'm very concerned that we have this policy that significantly weakens what seclusion is in Missouri schools. This policy has been adopted by Joplin School District, by St. Charles School District, by Houston, and many other school districts. I left my paper, so I wanted to be quick. Um, and it's being adopted. So we need a strong state law so that we don't end up with policies that really weaken and allow schools to lock children alone in a room with an adult watching through the window as a form of timeout. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, any questions for Ms. Schoen? Thank you very much. Uh, we might be able to finish if we, uh, I hate to limit anybody on this topic, but uh, if we can keep from being repetitive, we might save everybody a trip back down here next week. So go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Garrett Webb, registered lobbyist for the Missouri chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, supporting the bill, just wanted to be on record and do that, I won't take any more time. Thank you, sir. Any questions for, seeing none, uh, next. Uh, Good afternoon, I'm Heidi Geis-Buehler-Sutherland with the Missouri State Medical Association. Also, will not take very much time. We just wanted to echo the Academy of Pediatrics in support of the bill. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none. Hi, Chad McLaren, uh, with Columbia, and representing Race Matters Friends. Um, our, our concern has to deal with like the school and prison pipeline, and um, we believe that like number one, the more contact that you have with uh, law enforcement agencies in elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, the more you criminalize behaviors, that the more that's just going to compound the, the problems um, down, down the line. Um, again, like with the previous bill, I, would, I know this is going beyond the scope of this particular committee, but um, if we're talking about the definition here of um, the use of physical force, which is restraint, in, in what circumstances otherwise would you be able to use physical force against a child? And I, I think this comes down to like a child protective services type definition where we look at our SROs, um, our police officers, because talking to the chief of police, their policy as a normal police officer is anytime something becomes physical, it's a plus one uh, response. So if somebody comes to you like with a knife, you bring out the taser or whatever else, and escalate. They're not trained to de-escalate. And so having that mentality 
in school systems can be problematic by itself. Um, but we also need to look at, um, for example, to identify um, you know, what is proper uh, behavior. Uh, all staff in the school should be at least trained to recognize these um, indications. Whether or not they're the same people to intervene, that might be a separate, separate level of training. But um, we look at the interactions with the police departments, with juvenile authorities, therapists, counselors, um, coaches, staff, teachers, foster care systems. Um, any kind of third party agencies that are out there um, also need to be covered and regulated by what's an appropriate level of force to use to restrain a child. Uh, I think like doing it just within like the school district is, is cutting it short and I think that leaves children at risk, especially when you got people who are willing to refer to an organization uh, which this bill will not cover because it's not technically part of the school system. But otherwise, I, I think that this is a, a solid start. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Ms. Clinton? Thank you. How many people are left here to, to testify? Is there anybody here for informational purposes? Okay, all right. Proceed now. for Shawan Daniels. This is Shawan Daniels. She lives in Boone County. Her son is a fourth grader in Columbia Public Schools and has an IEP. He attends a school called CORE, where all the kids in the school have an IEP. It's a segregated school. This school year, CPS hired a company called Catapult to work with about 30 kids at CORE. Most of these people don't have teacher certifications. Catapult built the two wooden boxes in this building that we've been discussing today. They would send students there for any type of misbehavior. Sometimes they lock them in and other times they leave the door open. Shawan had no idea that these boxes were going to be built inside her son's school. She had no notification. They just started building them one day. She found out and her son was told to go in a box one day when he was frustrated with his work and this severely traumatized him. Another day, November 4th, 2019, around one o'clock, her son was put into a restraint or hold as they call it. During the restraint, her son's arm was injured. The school did not notify her of the injury until around 3.45 p.m. that day. He was in severe pain all night. She had to take him to the hospital the next day where they diagnosed the injury and he had to wear a sling. It took her five weeks to get the restraint reports from the school. And when we received those, there were no signatures on them. The date and times did not match the summaries. And then we had to go back and ask for them again, and they're still missing information. It's been quite a mess. Her son has been traumatized. He's afraid of the people at the school. So she is in support of this bill so that there can be better protections for the children of Missouri. Thank you very much. Any questions? Representative Brown? To inquire the advocate, um, I just have a couple questions about CORE. So I know what CORE is in St. Louis County. It doesn't sound like this. Um, can you explain to me a little more about what CORE is? In Columbia Public Schools, CORE is a separate building in which children who have IEPs are sent there, they're bused there, so they're not allowed to attend their neighborhood school. Um, it is usually a team decision. Parents are basically told this is their only choice. It's either this, homebound or facing juvenile situations. Um, and many of the children just have some basic behaviors that could be addressed. However, it tends to be sort of a place where um, they just kind of shunt the kids over to when they are not really accessing all their um, behavior interventions and therapies that they could do. So, you made a statement about teachers not being certified? Yes, and so the side of the building now that um, is kindergarten through fifth grade is now um, contracted out to the school um, catapult, um, which is a privatized special education um, corporation, and they're in 35 states in the United States. They just started here in Missouri, and basically they will start and have a freestanding um, facility and then they'll start to spread inside the public schools and then eventually start to take over all of the um, special education teachers jobs and that's what you see happen in the other 35 states and the teachers aren't certified no I have lots of other questions that yeah hold on so do we thank you so much <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Representative Bailey? Uh, real quick, so this is the school that has the 30, 30 kiddos and two wooden boxes. Um, and how big is the school? How many square feet approximately? I'm not sure. I believe there's probably one, two, three, four, like regular size classrooms in it. Is there any incentive to push these kids into peer classrooms? Well, of course, you know, under a least restrictive environment in IDEA, you're supposed to, but then when you are a contracted, you know, part of a facility and you are um, going to make money for every child that comes into your space, there will be a huge conflict of interest as you enter into those IEP meetings. Because why would you um, make it to where that child goes back to their neighborhood school? I mean, that's supposed to be the goal, yes, but is it happening? I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, also they don't provide art because you know you're supposed to be certified in art in the state of Missouri to teach it. They don't provide um, music. They didn't provide PE and there was no library time offered to these children. They also shortened the day by 45 minutes as compared to all the other um, elementary buildings in the district. So they fall under no regulation whatsoever? It does not appear so. And what does CPS say about it? They tend to pass the buck. Okay, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, we're just about out of time. Um, we can, uh, I think we might just uh, end this and continue the hearing next Wednesday morning. And we'll notice that up, and it'll be next Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and HR 7. So thank you very much, folks. I appreciate everyone's patience uh, very much. Thanks.